Welcome to the first Sunday in August. I don't know how many of you have gotten stuck on the planner obsession, but date books are morphing from these boring day timers that just keep your appointment straight to bullet journals and decorated planners that keep track of everything from your habits to your medical issues, your Bible study, and your improving handwriting. Sometimes they can be a bit daunting, especially when you see those lovely spreads on Instagram that turn three appointments and some laundry into a gorgeous spread. Occasionally, I think we forget that planners are supposed to be a helpful means of reflection about who we are and who we want to become. The thing I like about my planner is that it helps me see both forwards into the future and backwards into the past. I can look at my habit tracker and figure out what things I was good about following through with and what things either need more energy or need to be given up right now, acknowledging that this isn't the right time for that particular change. Weight loss, not going well. These readings today reflect a similar desire to look back and reflect and look forward into the future. In our first reading, we read that David, during the time when the kings go out to war, stayed home rather than leading his army, as would have been typical. Missed that one on his planner. His troops were living in tents defending the kingdom, while he is hanging out on the top of his house playing Peeping Tom with all of the soldiers' remaining wives at home. Is it really surprising that he found somebody ritually purifying herself on the roof? Can you imagine what his weekly planner might record? First today, I committed sin by coveting Uriah's wife. Then he compounds his sin by stealing his wife, committing adultery, and then when he finds out that he can't hide his indiscretions, he commits false witness and the sin of murder in the hope that Uriah, with Uriah out of the picture, no one will say anything about his behavior. He doesn't even just kill Uriah. The general was worried about how many other soldiers might be killed in his attempt to kill Uriah. And David just says, people die in battle. His planner was not looking good that month. He obviously doesn't value the lives of his soldiers as much as he does his own reputation. Nathan is in a difficult spot. He was the one to anoint him king over Israel. And now he's wondering maybe he made the wrong decision. He was the one to tell him that God would make a dynasty through David. And now God tells him that he has to call him out. Kings have a bad habit of trying to kill prophets that tell them things they don't want to hear. So he has to be sly. Rather than coming at him directly, he has David indict himself by telling him a story of a, of a poor man that had little, but loved what he had, and the rich man who loved nothing and took from the poor man what little he had. The thing that David forgets is that the sin is not just against Uriah or Bathsheba. The sin is against God. And no matter what you do, you cannot hide from God. That little thing in the back of your head that makes you feel guilty when you're eating, you know, that stolen piece of candy. Yeah, that's kind of God. We know what we do wrong, and we know that we do it to God as much as to our neighbor. And yet, it's hard to do anything else. Even though he is ordained by God to be the father of nations and to be the line in which Jesus will spring, he wasn't able to, get, to keep from committing sin. Even more, although he immediately admits that he has done wrong in the eyes of God and of his people, it didn't mean that his sin wouldn't cost him and his family for generations. His son by Bathsheba dies from an unknown illness within days of his confession. His son Absalom first kills his half-brother Amnon after Amnon rapes Tamar. Then he in turn is killed by David's general when Absalom rebels against David. 
Finally, David's son Adonijah is killed because of suspicion of rebellion after David dies. And there follows a whole bunch of bad kings, lost battles, captivities, and disasters. They weren't all David's fault, of course, but it's still hard to go against the stream. It's easier to go with the flow, and in this case, the flow went with, and each was worse than any before. How many leaders of nations care more about their reputations than the people they supposedly serve? David is hardly the last leader to believe that because he was ordained to be a leader, he could take a few liberties. God wouldn't mind. We see this every day in the news, leaders who take from the public coffers, justifying it because they will pay it back, or who make laws to make their friends and themselves richer at the expense of the poor, or who lie in order to make themselves look good, only to blame the whistleblowers when the truth comes out. But they're hardly the only people who sin. None of us are without short-sightedness, hard-heartedness, or selfishness. Whether we think of our personal sins or our collective sins as groups or nations, the consequences last much longer than the pleasure of the sin does. What we do has consequences, and saying, I'm sorry, and truly repenting doesn't mean that our actions won't follow us and our people. Even a king isn't above the laws of God. From the time we left the garden, we fight our desire to do the wrong thing and our reluctance to do the right. Rabbi Barry Schwartz, in his book, Path of the Prophets, points out that human beings have the ability to know good and bad, Genesis 3.32, but also that sin crouches at the door, its urge is towards you, yet you can be its master, in Genesis 4.7. There's always tension between our desire to do good and our tendency to go after what we want, regardless of the cost to others. We have the capacity for great love and great evil. The Talmud says, who is a hero? He who subdues his evil impulse. We must all stand before our God and our community and be called to account. We look at the poor and the immigrant and think that it is too much for us to fix. And it is. And yet righteousness is our calling. We were created in the image of God, so we are capable of making changes that make the world a better place. Just as David made things first better and then worse in his selfishness. Look at the ways in which the world has improved in the last 200 years when you start to think that nothing you do will help. Abraham Joseph Heschel in his essay, My Reasons for My Involvement in the Peace Movement, wrote that the task of man is to be a voice for the plundered poor, to prevent the desecration of the soul and the violation of our dream of honesty. The more deeply immersed I became in the thinking of the prophets, the more powerfully it became clear to me that the lives of the prophets sought to convey that morally speaking, there is no limit to the concern one must feel for the suffering of human beings, that indifference to evil is worse than evil itself, that in a free society, some are guilty, but all are responsible. In John's Gospel, Jesus asks to stop looking for the miracle of bread for our stomachs and to focus on the bread that gives light to the world. We are called by grace to Jesus and our lives show forth that gratitude. We welcome our brothers and sisters in all their diversity of color, creed, rich and poor. All of us are part of God's kingdom and we can treat one another with patience and humility, gentleness and love. We give as Christ gave. We work for the kingdom of God that Jesus believed we could accomplish. Let us not be indifferent to the suffering of others, but try to love 
as Jesus loves, with gentleness and courage to do what is needed. Amen.